Michael from Worcester, Massachusetts inquired about the Yari, the Japanese spear. And he asked, Mr. Norcross, you mentioned that the Yari was one of the scariest weapons on the battlefield. Why is that? I'm not 100% sure of that, Michael. I'm not a historian. And the research that I've done does not really tell you what weapons took the most lives. I am assuming that the Yari, because it was around for hundreds and hundreds of years, would have probably taken more lives than anything. Now, you might argue that the Yumi, the bow and arrow, would take more lives, or the Teppo, or the Tanagashima, but the Katana wouldn't have because that would have been a secondary weapon or a third tier weapon on the battlefield. You would have had a spear like this, you would have had a Naginata, perhaps a bow and arrow, some sort of pole arm would have been the primary weapon because it was cheaper to make, again, making a small metal shaft is not as expensive to make as it is a full-size sword and these were readily available and there were thousands and thousands of different nagi and nata zen spear out there if you go on wikipedia and you research research the japanese spear there are so many different types really cool shapes and designs that they came up with over the years in order to pierce that brutal armor that yoroi behind me because that's like a walking tank very hard to pierce that, even with arrows, with the sode and stuff. But you get one of these spear in a competent person's hands, that thing will pierce through the metal plate of that. I love the Yari. As a matter of fact, last night in black belt class, we did a Yari kata. I showed them one, but the spear actually loses. The primary purpose of a spear, and this is called a su Yari. Su is just a straight simple two-sided sharp blade spear and this this one's about six feet tall obviously it's made of wood for training we wouldn't use a real one i have seen spears that go anywhere from three to four feet like an ashigaru foot soldier might have a short spear up to 18 to 20 feet long well how is that possible where well, the shaft was massively long so that you could poke cavalry and horsemen riding by. You would have lines and lines of soldiers with spears and hundreds and hundreds of people stabbing in the front line. And then you'd have the secondary line who might have been uphill a little bit, stabbing over the shoulders with these longer spears. So you were busy fighting the front line and all of a sudden these spearheads from above or underneath poked you and you were just like that poor guy there. You were just poked full of holes. This here, the Suyari, the simple shape, there are dozens of types of these. Then you have the Sankaku Yari, which is a three-sided, much thicker blade here. Three sharp sides. If you got stabbed with this, you might survive. You know, that wound can be closed up, very thin. You get hit with one of these, you're dead. Look at that, how thick that is. So you can, if you drove that through the armor, and you twisted it in the wound, it's gonna create a one inch hole, like a shotgun slug or something, and that is gonna bleed out, put you to sleep, to die quickly. So these three-sided blades were used a lot. Now this one here is called a Jumonji Yari. A Jumonji is just a cross-shaped Yari. So you had these nasty hooks here, you had the long blade, and these were sharpened here as well. You could hook the opponents uniform, their gi, their armor, hook their helmet. You could hook guys off of horses if you got hold of the reins or something. All kinds of functions with this. You could block swords and spear with this part here. This is a Fukuda one where, the Fukuda one is the one where the, the, uh, the shaft goes over the wood here. So unlike ones that would have a tang, like this one would have a tang, which is the, like the rat tail tang, which is a shard of metal that goes into the shaft of the, uh, the spear. These were the ones that just had the head themselves, all one piece, and this would, you know, you'd hold it in with some nails or perhaps lacquered bamboo, or they had metal uh, rings that would hold this on. So you could imagine these were very cheap to make, unlike a, a sword, which took a lot of steel and time. These heads could be manufactured a lot quicker. That's not to say they were poor quality. A lot of swordsmiths made spearheads, and you'd, some have signatures on them that you can find on eBay. But beautiful, beautiful weapons. You go on Wikipedia, there's dozens and dozens of shapes. So this is a Jumonji Yari here with just the head part. If you buy one of these online on eBay, they're anywhere from 2000 up way past $10,000 just for the head and the tang. You're not going to get the handle because the wood would have rotted away 
hundreds of years ago, but you can find real sharp, really beautiful, handmade Yari spear online. And you can collect them, and they have the signature often of the maker on there. Beautiful, they have the, the scabbard sheath you can get. So you can start a collection of these, but expect to pay as much as a used car to get just one of them. And of course, if you know someone, you could probably make uh, a wooden shaft for yourself if you wanted to make a full spear. But there are different types. You had a kamayari, a kagiyari. Kagi means hook, so you had spears with hooks of all different shapes. The kamayari, which had a spear with a sickle on it so that you could mow people down. All kinds of just nasty shapes and sizes of these things. Sasaho, which is a, a one that looks kind of like a, a, a leaf. So you had ones that curved out like a big leaf, almost like the African spears. Really cool designs. Again, just a powerful, vicious weapon. But Michael, thanks for that question. That's a good question from Worcester, Mass. My old stomping grounds. I was born and raised in West Bridgewater, Massachusetts, which is about 30 miles south of Boston. Those of you who know the East Coast, you have Boston and you have Cape Cod. I was born in between that, near the Plymouth area where the Pilgrims landed. And my old teacher, Mark Davis, still has a school called the Boston Martial Arts Center. Anyone in that area should train with Mark. He's a great teacher. I learned with him for many years before I moved to Ohio in 1999. But Worcester, an old, they're gonna get a big storm this week. A lot of snow up there. Thanks, Michael, for that question on the Yari Spear, and I'll show you a bit more, a few more photos before we stop uh, from the internet on the spear, and sometime I'll show you a kata. We did a black belt kata last night in class with the Yari Spear, but on this kata, as the spear is thrusting in, the swordsman won. As the spear is thrust in, you overextend yourself. So if I have the spear and I overreach too far with this 12-foot shaft here, and you're top-heavy because of the heavy metal at the end, well, the swordsman has a, a brief time where you can take your sword and parry down that weapon, digging the yari into the dirt. And then the samurai holding the yari kind of falls forward. You jam it with the suba, the guard of the sword, of the katana, and then you run that blade right up the shaft, cutting their fingers or cutting their throat. In other words, you close the distance. With a yari spear, you're a dead man. And if you have ten people, I don't care if you have five Musashi-class warriors, they're going to be killed because you cannot fight people that have a yari if there are multiples of them. You can defend yourself with your sword all you want, but you can only see so many angles and then you get hit from 10 feet away with about six of these, you're a doomed person. Don't underestimate the power of a spear. It was very, very much feared by the samurai warriors because any moron could take this and stab you in with it with holes. And if you have a thousand morons with a thousand spear on the front line and you say, go forward and poke holes in whatever's in front of you, that's a powerful little army you have right there. Beautiful weapon. Let me show you a couple more photos before we stop. Here you have three suyari mounted in koshirai, including a harame crossbar. Pretty cool. Yukio, a yeah, print of a samurai general holding a yari in his right hand. This is an omi yari, a large spear from the Tokyo National Museum. Here's a straight yari, another suyari, which is about a shaku or 30 centimeters in length. Pretty cool. A Jumonji Yari spearhead with a metal collar. There's a really large tang here, which was equal to the blade length often. Here's another one. Remember this one? This is called Kikuchi Yari, or a single edged blade here. There's a Sasaho Yari with that kind of leaf shape there and this huge divot. All kinds of different shapes and sizes, kamiyari, kagiyari, you name it. Uh, whatever the smith's desire or the general's command was, make this type of spear for this purpose. Perhaps historically in battle they were used for different reasons. All kinds of different spearheads here. Really quite artistic and deadly at the same time. Those of us in martial arts appreciate this beauty uh, of this powerful weapon. Of course, we try to stop violence. That's what Bua Budo means, to stop a spear. But 
if you had to use one, you might as well learn from the best, which in my opinion were the samurai warriors of Japan.